Good morning and welcome back to House Judiciary Committee and we are working on S-163. The state court petitions for vulnerable non-citizen youth. Um, we're looking at the version as passed by the Senate and we are starting our witness testimony. I'd like to welcome Judge Zone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Tom Zone, Chief Superior Judge. And I would want to thank uh, the chair and Amber Burke. Uh, I did have another obligation later and she's been just wonderful. And, and the chair is uh, appreciated too for uh, letting me be able to testify and make all my commitments today. So I, I can be pretty brief, I think. The short of it is that in 2019, the legislature passed an act that addressed these important issues for uh, non-citizen youth. The bill that was introduced into the Senate, S-163, was designed to clarify jurisdiction and procedures for the state courts to make special findings for at-risk non-citizen children who were petitioning for the special immigrant status. It was also extending jurisdiction to state courts to make those findings uh, youth who had not yet achieved, uh, reached the age of 21. When the testimony was taken before the Senate Judiciary Committee, there were a number of concerns that had been identified. I will say I identified concerns the judiciary had, other stakeholders identified concerns. Those concerns were addressed. We had discussions with the stakeholders. They were addressed by the committee. And I can say that the bill that is before this committee today as passed does uh, meet with uh, the approval of the court in terms of we support this bill. It does uh, do what it's set out to do, and that is provide the uh, clarification and the extension as sought originally. And so we support this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? That's it. Great. Well, Thank you. <laughs> Have a safe day, everyone. Take care. Great. You too. Take care. Okay. So, good morning and 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 um, welcome, uh, Jill Rudge. That's the first time um, I've met you, and welcome to the House Judiciary. And and uh, thank you so much for being with us and uh, testifying on in this bill. Good morning, and thank you so much for having me. Um, for the record, my name is Jill Rudge, and I am an assistant professor and the lead immigration clinic attorney at Vermont Law School. I am overcoming a cold, so I apologize about the hoarseness of my voice. Um, I am really privileged to be here um, and to voice the clinic support for this bill. Um, I was unfortunately unable to attend the read through this morning. So, um, and I appreciate how valuable everyone's time is. So I might just ask the chair if it would be helpful for me from my immigration legal perspective to provide some context and background as to why I support the bill or whether it would be more helpful for me to focus on some of the actual cases I'm litigating on, that fall under the statute. Actually, both would be would be wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Great. Wonderful. Yeah. So, um, you know, thank you again for this opportunity to offer testimony on the bill. It stands to ensure full access to justice for all federally eligible non-citizen youth. In offering testimony today, I draw from my experiences representing special immigrant juvenile status eligible youth in Vermont, as well as several years representing SIGE uh, eligible youth in New York in both their state court and federal immigration matters. Congress created special immigrant juvenile status to offer at-risk non-citizen youth under 21 who are dependent upon a state juvenile court, a pathway to safety and stability in the United States when the reunification with one or both parents is not viable for reasons relating to abuse, abandonment, or neglect. When a state juvenile court has taken jurisdiction over questions relating to a non-citizen youth's health, safety, or welfare, Congress has empowered the Department of Homeland Security to extend to that youth a pathway to permanent residency if the state court makes findings that the youth meets the elements of an SIJ under the Immigration and Nationality Act 101A-27J. Um, when the Vermont legislature um, passed the original version of this uh, law, 
it clarified the jurisdiction and procedures for Vermont state courts to make these special findings for any dependent non-citizen youth, um, which in Vermont until now has only included youth under 18. This has meant that non-citizen youth over 18, but who have not yet attained 21, have not had access to fully enjoy their federal immigration rights to permanency, which is really a right to safety and stability and protection under the law. In effect, vulnerable non-citizen youth ages 18 to 21 are missing out on opportunities to receive work authorization and health care, to apply for financial aid, to attend college, to get licensed to practice their professional technique or trade, to accrue time towards citizenship so that they can publicly participate and vote, all of which are necessary to restabilize an at-risk non-citizen youth health, safety, and welfare. The Immigration Clinic fully supports Bill um, S-163 before this committee today because of the three key ways we see it advancing equal access to justice. First, it extends probate and family division jurisdiction for the limited purpose of making special findings for <laughs> dependent at-risk non-citizen youth to allow eligible youth under 21 the opportunity to petition the federal government for special immigrant juvenile status as provided by the INA. The bill also clarifies um, with what scope and level of detail a Vermont state court may make these special findings to help ensure that the federal government deems those findings sufficiently detailed as to clearly establish the at-risk youth eligibility for SIJ and accepts the state court's order on its face. It also clarifies the procedures and purpose of 14 BSA 3098 by bringing the language closer into line with the language um, included in INA 101A27J. So for some example cases, I represent presently a handful of at-risk non-citizen youth from across Vermont's regions who are seeking special findings under this statute. And in my experience, the changes introduced by this bill will serve to improve access to justice for this small but vulnerable group of individuals immensely and with no cost to the government. I can offer several examples. I'm gonna change some of the details. Um, you know, they're going to be annoyingly vague to uh, protect their identity and confidentiality. Example one involves a young client who fled an abusive parent, her dad, in her country of origin. Her non-abusive parent, her mom, had also fled dad earlier who was her partner, um, she fled within an inch of her life, leaving child in the custody and care of mom's parents, the child's maternal grandparents. Dad's family and country of origin is wealthy, abused the legal system there to obtain custody of the child over mom's objection and over maternal grandparents' objection, enabling dad to subject her to various forms of abuse and neglect. Child fled as soon as possible and reunited with mom here, who sought an order of custody and care under Vermont's parentage statute in the family division so that mom can have documentation that ensure her right to make decisions about child's physical and mental health care, her schooling, her development. The current 14 BSA 3098 codifies in state law the family division's jurisdiction to make special findings for this at-risk non-citizen youth who faces imminent risk of removal to her country of origin. The proposed amendments in this bill would help ensure that the language, format, and level of detail of those special findings will clear the ever-increasing thresholds set by federal policy and show that this child is in fact at risk and that child's mother did enter state juvenile court for uh, the purposes of ensuring her health, safety, and well-being. Example two, and to the point of over 18 SIDS, um, I represent a teenage youth who lost both of her parents to issues relating to violence in her early childhood. Maternal grandparents provided for her as long as they could, but they are now too sick to provide for her safety and well-being. As she reached adolescence, she could not consistently make the unsafe route to school. Then her health began to deteriorate rapidly, since it turns out she has a chronic illness that, if left untreated, leads to certain death. She fled here as soon as possible to reunite with a relative who has petitioned for guardianship of her in the probate division. This will ensure that the relative, as with the previous example, has the ability 
to help guide the child's physical and mental health care, her schooling, and her development as she enters her teenage years. They also seek special findings so the child can petition for SIJ and terminate her removal proceedings in immigration court. Pandemic-related slowdowns in the court system have caused my client's petition to languish in the system. Were the pandemic to continue, or if child was just a couple of years older and nearing the age of 18, she may well reach 18 or have reached 18 before receiving her special findings and, uh, for SIJ, um, preventing her from petitioning for SIJ from the federal government and losing her opportunity to seek legal status, work authorization, access to health insurance and financial aid, and ultimately protection from removal to a country where no one can care for her or protect her or provide for her health care to prevent her grave illness or even death. This bill, S-163, ensures that an at-risk non-citizen youth in this client's position has the ability to access pathways to health and safety and well-being, these pathways that Congress afforded when it created special immigrant juvenile status at INA 101A27J. To conclude, um, I will share that while the special immigrant juvenile cases I work on admittedly represents a discrete proportion of my docket, I don't think that this is a really numerous population, although you know, I'm not doing affirmative outreach in the community, so I, I can't speak with certainty to need. Um, it's a really important group uh, of non-citizen Vermonters, folks who are in the most vulnerable position that a non-citizen Vermonter might face, an at-risk youth who is at risk of removal. And so I think with um, these changes, we're going to improve access to justice for really important and vulnerable population. And I have bared witness to the incredibly stabilizing effects for an entire household that a pathway to permanency like this for an at-risk youth can have. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, thank you very much. Go ahead, yeah. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I'm wondering if you can flesh out for the committee a little bit more, like what happens, what kinds of conditions, what these youth face when they are, when they, when they, when like removal proceedings are successful and they're just, is Sorry, to, cl to clarify the question, is the question regarding um, what kinds of factual situations give rise to a SIG eligible youth coming to Vermont or how removal no. proceedings play out? Yeah, how the removal proceedings play out when they are successful and a youth, uh, like successful, you know, in the, that's probably the wrong language here, but when a youth is removed through those proceedings, what kinds of conditions are they likely to face in the country that they're returned to? Absolutely. So almost exclusively, the young people that I represent here in Vermont are folks who um, either present themselves at a port of entry when they're crossing the border, the Mexican U.S. border, um, or are detected crossing the border without inspection. Um, they are put into removal proceedings. Um, and then they're taken into the Office of Refugee Resettlement custody until a sponsor can be identified for them to be released from custody where um, they can be living with that sponsor and um, defending themselves in removal proceedings in immigration court. Um, for a, you know, a lot of these youth, the youth we're talking about, those who are eligible for SIJ, um, you know, it's a bifurcated process where at first, the youth must seek um, you know, their special findings in the court um, upon which they've become dependent by virtue of being at risk. And then they must petition USCIS for special immigrant juvenile status. That whole time, the immigration court process continues to run. And in Vermont, our cases are venued in the Boston Immigration Court, which for a clinic of my very small size, it's a very labor intensive process going down to Boston to extend um, representation to these youth. Um, but we're there um, explaining to the immigration judge that this person may be removable as charged at the moment, but is petitioning for SIJ um, and asking the court uh, for leave to um, let Vermont State Courts and USCIS complete its processes. Um, to the extent that there's a breakdown in the process, that the youth is not able to obtain the necessary state court findings or USCIS is not satisfied with the language 
that is included in the order from the state court and SIJ is not obtained or to the extent that the child might age out of eligibility um, and they have no other claims for relief from removal, then the immigration court um, can order them removed as charged. Um, and then these young people, at least my clients, I can speak about my docket, um, if they were to be removed to their countries of origin, not one of them would have um, an adult in their life who can care for them, provide for their safety, ensure that they're going to school, provide for their health care, um, and protect them from the people who are trying to harm them, as in the case of my, you know, my first client I shared with you who um, has an abuser in her life. Um, so, you know, my clients tend to not be detained anymore by the time they reach Vermont, right? They've been released from detention and are now appearing in immigration court on the non-detained docket. Um, but if they are ordered removed, then ICE can take them into custody and effectuate their removal. Thank you. And thanks for your work. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Hi. So I have a question related to um, expeditious adjudication. Um, it sounds great, but it's too vague in my mind. And I worry that if we don't say within, so it's like bottom of page four, top of page five, if we don't specify like within 60 days or within six months that these cases can languish. And I'm thinking a lot of just adoption cases even, or other cases where even though they're supposed to happen quickly, they don't happen quickly and that's not so great. <laughs> so do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, and I would definitely defer to the other witnesses as well. Um, I, you know, I don't want to speak for anyone else or for the Senate Judiciary Committee, but it's my understanding that um, the Senate Committee was concerned about the, being too prescriptive about timelines um, in the event of something like COVID-19 that makes it literally impossible uh, to meet certain deadlines and like these catastrophic unforeseen situations. And um, I recall that there was um, a question about whether the, um, if the state was not able to meet these timelines, whether there would be a right of action. Um, I am an immigration rights advocate. Uh, so of course I have um, you know, my position that I, I always seek the um, statutory language that would put my clients in the best position to have access to, the, to justice. Um, and so certainly I share your concern about uh, the risk that a case could languish on the docket. As I mentioned, I have one languishing now. And if my client were just a little bit older, um, under the current language, she would be aging out of eligibility. And is it ever the case that if somebody's languishing, they're, langu they're languishing? I mean, I, it's, it's been troubling that there have been people sitting in jail during COVID awaiting their trial for a really long time. Would that situation of a like secure residential program be where some of these young people are awaiting? Like, is, it, could that ha be happening to this population? So for non-citizen youth, I mean, it could, it could happen that there could be a young person who is in ICE detention um, while you know, they're in custody while they're awaiting uh, their, uh, the adjudication of their special findings petition for USCIS. Um, what I see more commonly is, um, you know, you're going to the immigration court and you're saying, judge, um, you know, we respectfully request a long adjournment on this question of my client's removability because while she is currently removable as charged, she, she soon won't be because she has a prima facie claim for special immigrant juvenile status. And I could see, depending on who is setting um, policy and procedure for the immigration court, which is not a special Article One court, it's a you know it's an administrative law court firmly um, situated within the executive in the political branch. I could see um, the court, as you know, we have seen in recent years, be more aggressive about um, pushing cases along and not wanting to grant vulnerable respondents like a non-citizen SID use um, the time that they need to allow the state court process to happen and the DHS process to happen. Um, and I could see 
vulnerable at-risk youth who are <clears throat> prima facie SIDGE eligible um, being ordered removed. So is there any protection that we might add to this bill to help in that situation at all? Um, you know, and I'd be curious to hear it from others again, but in, it is my perspective that um, by this bill kind of expands the bucket of individuals who are able to begin the two-step process in Vermont state courts to the fullest extent um, authorized by Congress in the INA. Um, and so it, it seems to me that this is a very um, robust approach in line with a lot of our neighboring states who have passed very similar legislation, including Maine and New York and Massachusetts. Um, and so I, yeah, I feel very um, supportive of the approach um, that this bill has taken. Thank you. How about New Hampshire? Are, are they included in that list? That is a great question, Representative. I have the list in front of me, so allow me <clears throat> to check. No, I do not see New Hampshire. Interesting. <laughs> what? Thank you. Excellent. Well, if there are no further questions, um, thank you very much for your time. And again, um, you know, to the extent that it would be helpful for the committee to hear from the clinic again, I would be very grateful to rejoin you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate your testimony and your work. Thank you. Thank you. And to the Attorney General's office, I see you. Uh, All right. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Bragg. Good morning to the committee. Um, for the record, Erin Jacobson from the Attorney General's Office, and I'm here to testify in strong support of this bill. Um, you've already heard from witnesses who've kind of explained the purpose of the bill, and Professor Rudd did a fantastic job of illustrating with case examples why why we need this bill and to your question representative Rachelson, why do we need this bill so i thought i could just step back a little bit to like how how this bill came about and in so doing also use a case example um, that illustrates kind of the backstory of how we got here so um back in 20 18 and 2019, I was working at the immigration clinic where Professor Rudge now works. And we were representing um, a family of um, four children um, from Angola. And um, they, along with their mom, who had representation out of Boston, they were all in removal proceedings. So the, our government was trying to deport all of them because they'd overstayed their visa. Mom had a really strong um, withholding case, which is like asylum, but the kids didn't have the same case. And so um, what we were able to do was through a proceeding, a parentage proceeding in Addison County, um, we were able to, um, first of all, make sure that mom, who was a single mom living with the kids in Vermont in a very vulnerable state, was able to get a parentage determination that she was the sole custodial parent of these four kids because in fact dad had disappeared nobody knew where dad was um there was there were some indications that maybe he um had that he was dead um that something bad had happened to him but also it, it, there were some indications that he had just kind of abandoned the family um, nobody really knew. So mom got this parentage determination that that um, that um, made it clear that she was the sole custodial parent. Through that process, we also asked the court if it could make the special findings for the kids so that we could then um, take those special findings from the state court and apply for special immigrant juvenile status. Well, the judge said, no, I don't have jurisdiction to issue these 
particular findings. Um, I can do the parentage, but I can't say anything as to, um, for example, whether or not it's in the child's, the children's best interest to be returned to Angola. And it, it turned into a fairly long, complicated legal battle that ended up um, going on for several months, maybe, maybe more than a year actually, ended up in the Vermont Supreme Court where we did um, win a, through a unanimous decision that, uh, yes, our state courts do have jurisdi jurisdiction to make these requested special findings because our courts are, um, um, the purpose of these, of these proceedings is to make best interest determinations for kids, and it is our state courts that, that have the expertise when it comes to care and custody of children. So there is a favorable decision out of Vermont Supreme Court, and that was in June of 2019. Um, however, nothing in statute, nothing codified. And so then um, in 2019, um, began the effort to, to codify this, um, the, the jurisdictional um, ability of courts to, to issue these special findings. There was a bill. And then um, in that bill, there was also the over 18 provisions, which at the very last second, I think it was like the day before the, the state house was to close down for COVID, um, the over 18 provisions got scrapped from the bill. Um, and that was in, so that was in March of 2020. Um, fast forward then, um, this bill is, is, is a, a next step from, from that bill in 2020 to really clarify what the purpose of these findings are, that all of, the, all of our state courts have jurisdiction to issue these special findings, and that also that's the case for kids who are over 18, which then aligns with the federal law, allowing for kids between the ages of 18 and 21 to get special immigrant juvenile status. I should also add that in that, that case that ended up in the Supreme Court, the oldest child was 17 and three quarters when we were fighting with the court about needing these special findings and we needed them quickly. What we ended up having to do was ask for an expedited processing with the Supreme Court um, and we had to quickly turn around our brief and then have expedited arguments. And then we had to ask the court um, to, to, order the, to the, order the lower court to quickly issue the findings before the child turned um, 18 because otherwise he was going to age out. And that happened um, approximately 10 days before his birthday. So we don't, that's the kind of situation where the, the litigation went on and on and on. It was really complicated. It was really fraught. Um, the oldest child is about to age out. They're in removal proceedings. Um, and then we had to ask for this expedited processing at the highest court. So in part, this bill is just to avoid all of that um, and also just make it clear that, of course, our courts have the authority to issue the findings if requested. Really helpful. Um, Ken. So I'm, I'm just curious, going back to the dad that just disappeared, was he in the in the U.S. when he disappeared? He was at one point, um, and then he left the family um, in um, and he never came back. No one ever knew where he went or what happened to him. Um, and I guess I would just say too that that situation also illustrates why in the bill there's language about um, abuse, abandonment, um, neglect, or similar circumstances. So under federal immigration law, a death of a parent could be similar circumstances. Um, the situation where one of the parents just kind of disappears, um, even if it wasn't of their own volition, maybe something bad happened to him, that would satisfy abuse, abandonment, neglect, or similar circumstances. So, so I have one more question, and, and, and I probably missed this, and it's already been asked and answered, but, but this seems like to me like we're dealing with something that the federal government should be dealing with. How did it get to this point 
and why and just make it as quick as you can because I don't want to bore everybody. <laughs> well, you're not it, boring me. <laughs> really, really, I, I mean, I'm... I think it's a really insightful question. And here's, here's the reason why, because Congress decided that um, when they designed special immigrant juvenile status, when they created that humanitarian relief. When did that happen? That was in the 90s, I want to say. I think it was 1992. I could get back to you on exactly when that law was passed. I'd like to know what administration sure. that was. Uh, I'm fairly certain it was the Clinton administration, but I will get back to you. Thank you. But Congress felt that um, because the relief was for children who are abused, abandoned, or neglected, it's, it was initially created for kids who are like maybe in foster care, um, who had foster parents who were perhaps US citizens, but the kids had no status. So there was, there was a real inability to make sure that the kids had safe safety and security in the United States. That was kind of the initial purpose of the bill, was to create status for those vulnerable abused kids. However, Congress felt that it, the, um, at the time, the Immigration and Nationality Service, which is now Department of Homeland Security, but the Federal Immigration Agency did not have the expertise to make determin determinations about care and custody of kids. That they, that's just not their area of expertise. So they created this two-part scheme where they said it starts in the state courts, you get the findings, and then you can apply for the federal status. Does a birth birth certificate come in in a, any type of this area at all? Does that mean anything with dealing with this type of stuff? I'm not certain I understand the question, a birth certificate. I um, so so the, the identity of of where the the kids come from and and all that stuff. Is there any uh, a, a starting point of their life that the government would look at to try to to identify with these individuals? Well, certainly, when you apply for any kind of immigration status with the immigration agency, you have to prove your identity, okay. and if you're applying for special immigrant juvenile status, you would want to prove that you're not a US citizen, that you were not born in the United States. Otherwise, if you were born in the United States, you wouldn't need the status as well. You would wanna show where you're from because you need that special finding about how it's not in your best interest to be returned to your country of origin or your last habitual residence. So it's important that you're able to prove um, who you are and where you're from in that context, for sure. Yeah. Oh. Um, I do see that um, Professor Roach has her, um, their hand up. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Attorney Jacobson, if I may offer, because I have the benefit of testifying virtually, I have access to my, all my things here. And oh, thank you. The representative's earlier question about when SIJ was um, added to the INA. So Congress added SIJ to the Immigration Nationality Act in 1990 under their President George H. Bush administration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's see any hands. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Rebecca. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning, committee. Morning. Good to be back. Uh, for the record, Rebecca Turner at the Defender General's office. Uh, I've, ap I've appeared before you many times, and, and you're certainly aware of, of my, my work in the Defender General's office. What you may not be aware of, before I, I came here to the Defender General's office more than 15 years ago, I was an immigration attorney. And one of the many hats I still wear within the Defender General's office is to be part of a, a team of other attorneys where we provide consults to other attorneys in our system, those, um, you know, the private uh, attorneys who are contracted in to represent uh, clients for assigned uh, attorneys or public defenders, uh, both in the family chins uh, proceeding context, delinquency context, and criminal criminal court context. And so as, as Judge Zone and Aaron have already spoken to, uh, 
we work closely, all of us together, when we, when this bill was before Senate Judiciary, uh, to come together to land on the precise language. You've gotten a sort of a taste of the highly technical nature of this status, what it takes to qualify, sort of the complicated nature, um, sort of the also unique in immigration statuses and immigration law, this requirement that Congress set up that Aaron was just talking about, this two-part process. Looking to the state courts to make special findings because it is in the state court's wheelhouse to consider the child's best interest and welfare, right, to make those findings to then bring it back to uh, federal immigration uh, requirements and federal immigration adjudicators to consider ultimate uh, qualifications. And as Aaron said, there's not just, you know, proof of identity, but there are background checks um, to make sure that you have criminal background checks. Uh, and it's just uh, the requirements to meet the status. We are just seeing the small part here, which is state courts uh, making findings as is deemed appropriate based on what is before them uh, that is consistent with uh, qualifying for this status. I think that maybe I'll, I'll just land on some of the questions I've heard raised and, and go from there. And, and also, if you have new questions, please, please let me know. I think one of the questions that um, I raised was relating to the purposes. Uh, there was a reference to maybe we can be better, better clarify the purpose section. I think that was page four. Was it page four? No. Page um, page five, section eight. There's a reference to uh, the purpose as construed by well, the, purpose, the legislative purpose of this bill. Certainly, I, I would not have any um, objection to bringing in the language that I saw put in as the purposes of, the, of this bill right here. So I think that would make it more clear. Uh, there was another question as to the purposes section. This is on page seven, bottom of page seven, section D. Structurally, this is sort of a, a set up to repeat and confirm that the family, that the courts that, uh, are landing on this in Title 14 have jurisdiction and also in Title 33. And so this bottom of page seven going to purposes is in uh, Title 30, 33. And so relative to the purposes section there, it is cross-referencing cross back to 5101. What is it? 5101. And um, in that section of Title 33, the legislature has set out the specific purposes under the CHINS scheme, the child uh, children in need of care and supervision proceedings, uh, the need for permanency, reunification to ensuring the safety of, of the child and so on. Uh, it's, it's a long established list of, of, of factors that the court has to consider whenever it is considering anything in these CHINS proceedings. And so we wanted to make sure that this section was consistent with that. Uh, there was discussion about it furthering uh, the understanding of child interest, child's best interest. And in the SIDGE context, there is oftentimes reference to the child's best interest. But in the CHINS context, that term has a special definition, its own statute, uh, defining what the child's best interest in, considerable case law developing what those statutes mean. So we wanted to make sure we didn't use the child's best interest phrasing in this section to cause confusion. And, and so all of that by way of saying we thought it best to, in that section, subpart D on page 7, to go back to the 5101 section. I think those are the questions that I heard. And I'll pause here. Are there any new additional questions? OK. Um, do you have thoughts about specifying a time period? Right. No, I, I, I think that I share your concerns. As Jill uh, relayed, she, that was my understanding of how uh, the issue was raised in Senate Judiciary, uh, that, that if there was a more prescriptive, specific requirement set out by the legislature to the judiciary, you must consider this within X amount of time, that 
it would get in the way of possibly other things like the, the court knows its docket best and, and can and can prioritize within um, and as we know circumstances changed and have changed in terms of of identifying how how quickly how many cases can go before the court but i do share the concern i think that the language in there which is not just as administratively feasible that's on page five top of page five it says that uh, this is in at least title 12 section twice title 14 section expeditious adjudication uh, the court shall issue findings as soon as it is administratively feasible uh, i think that it's it's strengthened by the and that immediately follows and prior to the non-citizen child turning 21. Because to me, that is the safety net there that we're, taught, we, we're concerned with. And what Erin talked about with her specific case, where she was just days away from her client, the child turning 18 and aging out. Um, so I know adoption cases are similar mm -hmm. in terms of the 18th birthday. And there's pressure from the feds in terms of like money if we're not in compliance with um, permanency planning. And yet it seemed it seems like some of those cases have taken a super long. So I still like yeah. I worry about like what's convenient for the court. And if if there's another pandemic, it, certain business needs to happen during this pandemic. And it seems like we shouldn't let people off the hook that way. So I just wonder about like people, I mean, the court, like we need to figure this out. Like we have people who could get deported. We have people who are sitting in chat, like we need to do something. So I, I guess I just wonder about leaving it to the court. Just, I get that the courts are busy and have competing interests, but, but we definitely, we, the legislature, I think, talk a lot about caring about kids. So, like, does, should this be red flagged as, like, these first? No, I would certainly support the additional language in that section of, of making sure it's clear that the legislature uh, intends these cases to be treated as top priority. Pandemic right? or not. Pandemic yeah. or not, that, 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 uh, the, and whether it fits into the purpose <clears throat> section, that we talked about bringing yeah, that yeah. language of the bill right into the statute itself. It could be there. It could be put in as, as given priority um, right, and put that there. I was trying to pull up the older version because I know that this language changed during uh, the course of, of discussions in, in the Senate judiciary. And I just don't have the original language uh, in front of me, but there might be something there to pull. Um, but no, I, I would support that. I would support that. Yeah. All right. How many cases are we dealing with it uh, per year? Yes, good question. We've been asked that. Uh, and I think that the Jill and Aaron can can speak to what they have seen in terms of what, and, and I was talking to, to Jen Micah at DCF about the cases that we've seen. And there have, we, we couldn't recall the cases in, in the state courts, family courts, chins context, which is where I would see them. Right. This is like more expansive would allow it to go into the probate guardianship probate court arena, which I think is where they would most more often come. And as I understand, that's where those cases have come. Um, but no, we have not seen one case where we've requested or I've heard about right where we were a client or a juvenile has asked a, a judge in family court chance proceedings for these findings. However, this is having this as an option as part of the toolbox for representing a juvenile, for representing a child who's been abandoned, right? And, and we're trying to, as, as, a, as an attorney representing their interests, think of all the various ways we can achieve that permanency and protection. One of them may be stabilizing their immigration status. These children come and have no status, right? It's, you, they can, if they qualify, get the special immigrant juvenile pa status, then then is their, their pathway to getting a green card, right? When the defender, uh, has that case and is looking 
We look at all sorts of things. Lots of times these children will qualify for other immigration statuses. This is a particularly difficult status to get, not that any of the others are easy, um, but it may make sense in any given case to pursue a different one, a crime against VAWA status under the um, VAWA. Crime against what? Uh, Violence Against Women Act okay. provides a way for uh, a child to get uh, immigration status. There are also other statuses um, for crime victims, right, working with a prosecutor. So there may be other ways uh, to achieve uh, legal immigration status besides this. So when we, when I say that there are, that I'm not aware of any known cases in the family chins court docket where a judge has been asked to make these findings, that's not to say the need for this doesn't exist. Right. I mean, Vermont, by its nature, demographically speaking, we have very few, relatively speaking, numbers of non-citizens. Um, but we do have in our chin system uh, children who are not citizens. We do have children in our system. We're representing children who don't have legalized immigration status, who are vulnerable, not just to having instability in their homes, which is why DCF had to intervene and, and bring that child into state custody. Uh, we have children who are also vulnerable for immigration to detect their undocumented <coughs> status and, and remove them um, from this country, even though there are these ongoing state court proceedings to protect them, right? Congress, again, of all the various ways that they've, they've determined and the ability for someone to gain lawful immigration status, they landed on this one. So here we are, and it, and it really is a narrow, um, technical correction from what was passed in 2019. As, as Aaron talked about before, uh, it was really, there was a lot going on in March and that session of 2019. And, and so what we are here to do is to make sure that the intent, which is to make clear that the state courts have jurisdiction over this, this narrow matter, uh, both in terms of the subject, you can issue these findings. You can issue these findings for children or youth <coughs> over 18 and less than 21. That was the other critical fix. Because right now, state courts uh, are limited in jurisdiction to a child who is not yet 18, right? In federal immigration law, a child is defined not as 18, but under 21. And so that's that fix too that this bill is, is trying to correct um, and make clear. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, I've Question before you go. So I'm still thinking about this <coughs> question, um, question and, um, and about possibly putting in a purpose or intent. But often those get taken out um, of bills or they end up in session law or something like that. Um, so I was wondering if you could remind me of the rules of statutory construction in terms of. Um, being liberally construed or, or should be construed in favor of the, somebody finished my sentence. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, like, if, is, is there a principle already? Um, in sure, I, the purpose, I mean, it's statutory rules of construction, and I think the starting place, the purpose is determined by the plain language of the statute, right? right? right. And so that is the, the start and finish. If it's clear, you don't go anywhere else. If it's ambiguous, less clear, then we look outside uh, of the record, including the purpose section of the bill, right? So it is stronger to have it directly in the statute itself. It will be uh, less ambiguous as to what was intended. Yeah, I'm just uh, sometimes in terms of the legislative process uh, purposes or findings and or, you know intent don't always don't always make it to the finish line. So I just just wanted a primer on the law, and, you know, the, the law and whether the law would be in our favor if for some reason we weren't, you know, able to to get that purpose in there. So, Martin. Yeah, just on that, and, uh, but we usually don't have a provision where we talk about construction and liberal historian. So, so the okay. fact that we have that there. Suggest we should have a purpose statement, and, and maybe that that makes the purpose statement more likely to survive through the whole process. But that wasn't my my question. I had it's very narrow actually. It's in the first page, and it's the definition of court. 
And do we need to have the including the probate division and the family division of the Superior Court? Is there a reason why you think we should keep that? Because, I mean, it's otherwise covered in the first part of that definition. Again, it was it was it was the intent of that was to make it crystal clear to those two courts, uh, which is where we anticipate belt and suspenders. That's right. Okay. Again, uh, and, uh, for sake of clarity and, and purposes, we are here, even though a version of this passed. So we're trying to make sure we we don't have to go back and, and dot another I. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yes, Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our last witness, um, Marita Canito from Migrant Justice. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Excellent. So, yeah, I think I'm here, you know, not as an attorney, but someone that uh, is really close to the community that we're talking about. And just to you know, put a little bit of reality of the situations and cases that that we see and happen, um, kind of the context of how you know parents decide to come here, in a way that's kind of forced migration because uh, opportunities back in their countries are not there, so families are separated in that way that parents have to come here and then years pass and because the situation here hasn't really changed much, um, and kids back home don't see the opportunities to keep studying or you know get uh, opportunities there have to migrate here again and we see kids coming after their parents were here for many years um you know all the psychological thing that comes with that that i i having grow up with my parent now i'm following their tracks coming to work uh, in the same situation that they are. So we keep the pattern of putting youth in vulnerable places. Uh, they might come and have the opportunity to get to the school, but the reality is that they cannot because they have to work. They have to start thinking about making their own money while parents have been there for many years, just helping them survive through the younger years. So expanding the protections for the youth is really going to bring them not only to keep the pattern of keep working in you know, conditions that are not great, but also giving them the opportunity to be young and understand that with that youth, they can really you know, <clears throat> grasp the life in a way that they really are, if they are here, they are protected to learn a new language, finish a school, um, start having jobs in different places, really uh, helping them to go through a way in life that doesn't have to be the same that their parents were forced to when they migrate here. Um, so that's what I wanna share. I think it's really important when we see uh, young people in the farms coming and, and it gets younger and younger and you know having them being hidden, uh, not really getting opportunities. Uh, I personally have my kids here growing up and I can see how, you know, having them the, the privilege and opportunity to not be afraid and be able to go to school and then apply for college and do all those other things really opens their mind and also made them like part of this uh, society in a good way that they're integrated. So we want that for these kids that come here too. We don't want them to be hidden in the farms or hidden in you know, home uh, because of the fear of um, their immigration status. I think we need to realize that they are still kids learning and we don't want them to learn that they have to be in the shadows. We want them to really be able to grasp the opportunities that they come from and it's not being uh, exploited uh, labor force. We want them to be, you know, like people that it's not the future, it's the present, and that they are going to be held in this world uh, for us to be better. Like we're getting older, they have to have uh, good opportunities and be well here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
Any uh, questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, wait. Oh, there's a new one. Not here. Just good. Okay. Great.